Yes, it is. Yeah, I won't be on the chat. It's 14. I'm supposed to start now. Someone let me know when you're here. It's the worst time to go out. For skinny me. Yes, it was. It's on sale for $92. That's the skinny me strip. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to take it, but you got to 
That's too hot not to have your beverage with you. Yeah, if you did have a little, I'd probably say okay. 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 Well, welcome y'all again. We're going to stay outside for just a minute or two. Real quick little history tour on the property. The Mercer Williams house starts with Hugh Mercer. Way back in 1859 is when he buys this property to build his family home. He's going to start building on both of these uh, structures here. He'll be about two years into it when everything stops because of our Civil War, 1861. He's going to go off to war, and when the war is over uh, in 1865, he's too ill to come back here. So Hugh Marshall will sell this property unfinished to the Wilder family, another local family. And so John Wilder will finish up and complete what Hugh Mercer had started. So it will finally be done in 1868. And John Wilder and his family will move in, and they will actually name this property the Mercer House, oh. out of deference to uh, Hugh Mercer and his plans and what he intended for the for the home. Come on up, y'all. Welcome. Welcome. We're just getting started. You didn't miss anything hardly. We're talking about Hugh Mercer. He's the start of the story way back in 1859. House gets completed in 1868. The first family moves in. It's the Wilder family. Now, I am going to skip over about 100 years of history, and we're going to go way up into 1969. And so this is about 100 years after the first family moved in here. And it's Jim Williams' turn to buy the property, and he's going to buy it to restore it. At this point, this place is a wreck. It's a mess. It's crumbling. It's falling apart because it's been vacant on this property for about 10 years. So Jim Williams has his hands full. He's got a lot of work to do. It'll take him two years to do all the restoration on the property to bring it back to its former glory and beauty, as if it were the Wilder family all over again moving into this beautiful home. And it's exquisite. We're going to go take a peek in just a second. But before we go into the home, let's talk about what's on the outside. This building that y'all were just in, this is a 3,600 square foot building, was originally built as a carriage house. So you have carriages and horses, a hayloft, and help. This back yard, this beautiful pumpkin garden that we're looking at, this was not here in 19, 1868. It couldn't have been. The horses and carriages, that wouldn't have worked so well. We had to have a flat, grassy piece of land, utilitarian in nature, obviously chickens running around, all that kind of stuff. But when Jim Williams restores the property, it is modern times. We're not going to use this as a carriage house anymore, so he's going to be by. So this is his design. This is what he chose to put in the back of his home, between, which will now be his shop. He's going to take the structure, the carriage house, and make it the carriage shop, where he's going to sell his antiques. At this point, he's about 40 years old. Jim Williams is known all over the world as one of the finest art and antiques dealers. So folks from all over the place can come shopping out here for 30 local streets. So he wants something quite nice in his backyard, nothing flat and grassy and utilitarian. And at this point for Jim Williams, he's a wealthy man. He's made all that money himself. He's a self-made man. He's made it from the antiques business. So he's going to move on into this home when he finishes uh, restoring it. So let's take a look at this house. It's quite nice. Come on up. You're welcome. architected not only for beauty but also too for another component that's really important for us here in Savannah and that's that heat. It's mighty hot here in Savannah. When this house was built in 1859, 1868 when it was completed we did not have central air and so it was really important to be thinking about how you can stay cool in the house. So when John Norris is architecting it he's thinking a lot about that 
That's one reason we have 15 foot ceilings. Of course, it's beautiful, the grandness. We have big old thick walls in the home. These walls in the home are all 15 inches thick. Wow. What sits behind the plaster is that same brick out there. So that's gonna help with insulation. Beautiful tile floor, nice and cool to the touch. So you can see why he's thinking on both sides, beauty and also the function for the heat. Now Jim Williams, when he buys his home, it does not look anything like what you all are looking at. This place is a wreck. There's no plaster on the walls, doors and windows are smashed out, long gone, chandeliers, no more mantles, fireplaces. I mean, it is really a wreck. Now, luckily, he had a lot of reference material on how to put it all back together. John Norris is the architect. There was a lot of documentation on how this home was first built and he could rebuild it. And he pretty much had to rebuild it. I will say the floors are all original to the build. That's one of the things that he would restore uh, you wouldn't have to redo floors except for the restoration. This is ceramic tile from England, Georgia hard pine on most of the floors. So that is an original piece of the home. Just like the beautiful millwork that goes around all your door frames. They were not able to be ripped out by anybody. Pretty hard to wreck Georgia hard pine, so that could be restored as well. Other than that, again, Jim Williams will put it all back together. And he was an exquisite restorationist. Now inside the home, everything that you're looking at is something he hand selected himself personally to be placed in the home. So he's traveling the world at this point when he lives in this home over and over again. So things in this home are from all over the world, all periods, all styles. He doesn't stick to any one thing. He just buys what he likes. He's eclectic and it's fun to look at his interior in the home. It's from all over the place. I and mean, this is a great example right here of what's just going on in the, in the center hallway. This is a contemporary piece. Uh, it's from 1950. Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse is the name of it. Western artist, contemporary piece of furniture. Over here we have one of his oldest pieces in his collection. This is from the 1500s. This is a very delicate tapestry uh, subject matter, pretty much the antithesis of that. It's a lamb, beautiful, still life, 1900s Russian artist in a classic, more a classic painting you'd find in a home like this from the 1860s. That's an 1850 um, oil. Um, landscape um, and it's uh, an English an English artist so very eclectic but you'll see as we go through the home it's a lot of fun to look at this eclecticness and what to pick out to put in his home and how he does it too. All right any questions y'all have before we go into the dining room? Who's who, who owns all, all of this today? Yeah so Jim Williams will live in this home he'll, he'll move in December of 1970 after he does his two-year uh, restoration and so he'll be here in this home from December of 1970 until 1990, so 20 years. He will have an unexpected fatal heart attack. Uh, suddenly in 1990, he's 59 years old when he does die. And when that happens, all of this will stay in the hands of his family. At the time when he passed away, that was his mother, sister, and two nieces. Today, is still this is still the private home um, used and loved by his sister and two nieces. So this is the family that still enjoys this. When you all go on here in 45 minutes, the whole house is back to being theirs. Mm -hmm. and, and otherwise, they're upstairs. So upstairs is their private area, and that's why we're not gonna visit upstairs. Mm -hmm. Three big old bedrooms over here, center hallway, and a big old ballroom on that side of the home. Okay, did you have a question? Man? Yeah, who are the portraits? Okay, nice question. In the home, you're gonna see a lot of people, a lot of portraits, that's Jim Williams' kind of specialty up on the wall. And he is gonna collect his portraits really couple of criteria. One, he's very interested in the painter, or two, he's interested in subject matter. Sometimes it's a little bit of both, but these are both of those. So the gentleman on the furthest one, this is a 17-year-old, and this is all about subject over here. His name is Alexander Telfair Habersham. You can only imagine, that's a double whammy of a lot of name for us here in Savannah, Telfair and Habersham. He grew up most prestigiously in the most prestigious home in the early 1700s. He grew up in the old pink house. Um, so that's where he grew up, again, quite the family. There's actually three portraits of him. It's only, Jim Williams doesn't even have three portraits of himself in the home. So three portraits of this guy, so much history with that one. Now up here, this is really all about the painter. This painter is Cosmo Alexander. Cosmo Alexander lived in England back in the 1700s. Super talented painter. And he's painting, of course, aristocrats, as you're seeing, but he had trouble, like a lot of talented painters do. Hands and feet were his nightmare. 
And so guess what he started to do? He started to tuck that hand away in the jacket so he wouldn't have to paint it. Well, his contemporaries thought that was pretty interesting, and they'd like to do that too, because no one wants to paint hands and feet. So this whole aristocratic style of painting that Cosmo Alexander started, instead, because everyone's doing it. And so when we get into the 1800s, if you, as an aristocrat getting painted, want to have your hands or your feet, legs, any limb showing, you are going to definitely pay a lot extra to have that done. So you know that little saying, what cost you an arm and a leg? Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of where it comes from. Cosmo, buddy Cosmo. Okay, let's go on into the dining room, y'all. His favorite thing to do is drag people in this house and have a big old party, small group, he'd love to have people in here. But this room is beautiful. He's got everything in here, uh, as little, just like his art collection out there. His furnishings in here are equally as eclectic, so they're from all over the world, from all styles and all periods. And so he's just got an eye for finding beautiful things and putting all this eclecticness together in a fashion that looks just quite magnificent to look at. Any questions y'all have right off the bat with anything you might be looking at? All right, I'll start with a couple of things. Uh, one, we did talk about um, our buddy Cosmo, the hand in the jacket guy. So he was a teacher of painting, um, and he was quite a teacher. He would teach one of our most important painters how to paint. And it happens to be this painting up here. This is a Gilbert Stewart painting. Gilbert Stewart learned how to paint from Cosmo. And Gilbert Stewart would go on, come here to America, and he'd be commissioned by George Washington and then our next four United States presidents to be painted. So Gilbert Stewart's our most acclaimed portrait painter here in the United States. This is an early painting that Gilbert Stewart did up here. Y'all know him real well. Y'all, if you've got a one dollar bill on you, if you look at that, it's a George Washington, that's a Gilbert Stewart. So you might have a little portrait in your pocket. Now up here, y'all, these paintings over here are all about subject matter. And there's a lot of history up here on the wall. At the very top, this is Miss Prelo. Miss Prelo is married to Mr. Prelo. He was the most influential wealthiest man in all of the low country. And so he had a huge amount of influence. And so this is uh, Mrs. Prelo, and uh, there's a lot of history that sits up here. This is the height of our cotton trade, y'all. And so there's a lot of the good and some of the darker periods of our history sit right up here with Miss Prelo. So a lot of history up there. Now down here, this is quite interesting. It's a beautiful painting. It's a rare painting uh, uh, from the late 1700s. Hard to find a painting of a gentleman of color dressed aristocratically and also painted in that aristocratic fashion. So this is an exquisite painting. Uh, this guy's name, his name is Mr. Theus. He was a Creole man. He actually lived in the West Indies and he was a wealthy plantation. So a lot of history on both of these, and that's why that is sitting in Jim Williams' uh, dining room. Sorry. Sorry, one more. another tapestry when we go into the blue room shortly. And, uh, but Mr. Williams did, in fact, love tapestries. Many of his tapestries aren't in the home anymore. They were actually sold after he passed away. Uh, but they're beautiful, uh, exquisite, exquisite pieces of art. Now, one more thing we'll talk about before we move on uh, is this blue and white china back here, y'all. It's a fun story to talk about. It's a remarkable story. It's from Nanking, from Nanking, China, back in the 1700s. 200,000 pieces of this fine blue and white porcelain were packed up, put on a ship, ship is sailing to Amsterdam where it's uh, going to be sold in the West. The ship is not going to make it because it's going to hit a reef, and that ship is going to sink to the bottom of the ocean floor with all that cargo. And it's going to stay down there for about 250 years. They will be able to find that ship in the 1980s. And when they find that ship, they can't believe what they have on board. It's almost 200,000 pieces of pristine porcelain china. And so it was sold, finally, in London, not in, not in Amsterdam. And there was an auction that Jim Williams would participate in 
to buy about 100 pieces of that fine and pink collection off of that ship. So that's some of what you see back there. So it's a remarkable wow. story. I love that story. And the plates? Yeah. Yes. They're, it's right. beautiful. Uh, it's all Baccarat. All Baccarat. This was uh, probably Jim Williams' most formal place setting. He had a lot of place settings depending on how informal or formal he wanted to dine. But this place setting meant a lot to him. It's got that W on it. That is a W that is from Baccarat. It's not specifically for Jim Williams. This was a gift given to him. He had a, a nice relationship with the rector at the church. And when the rector at the church received this beautiful place setting, uh, he said, I don't know what we are going to use this for at the church. But I got my good buddy Jim Williams that I think would love to have it in his dining room. So this was gifted to him. It meant a whole lot to Jim Williams to have this place setting besides it just being exquisitely beautiful and valuable. All right, anything else, y'all? Okay, next thing we're going to look at is uh, something that needed to be modernized in the home. We talked about the sunken garden, modern times. We're not in the 1800s. 1800s, no bathrooms particularly on the main floor. Jim Williams needs a powder room. He's entertaining all the time in his home. So we're going to take a look at his powder room. He's cleverly going to take a space that he no longer wants to use. It doesn't wreck the integrity of the home. It's a hallway that he's going to wall off and make space for his powder room. So let's go take a look at it. These are uh, Marana boxes of the family. Uh, The last two pieces actually he will put in the home. But anything that he acquired that you see, the last two things he bought. Down below us, y'all, in that basement, it's cool and dry. That cool, dry air gets sucked right up here. 
So this is your basically your air conditioning from back in the day. And that's why you're living here and that's why they help us in and out of here all the time because this is where you are. Now, Jim Williams is in modern times. He's got electricity, all these modern conveniences. He's going to put in central air and central heat. He doesn't need help and they don't have to be running in and out of here anymore. He needs it because y'all are running in here because you've been partying here at his house. We need these power. Okay, let's all make our way down this way. And then we can take a peek at that dome. Yeah, you're going in the right direction. Keep going. We'll get a little closer. You come over here. This is the best place to see it. That is standing right back here and look up. It's just, it's beautiful. But that is where all the hot air in the home goes. And again, around the rim is that. And all that hot air will escape. So about how much cooler? 10 degrees? Uh, it's quite a bit. So let's say, let's say it's 100 degrees outside. You probably have that, feel like it's maybe a little bit. Yeah, this house and a lot of the homes that you'll see, this house is exquisitely designed for cover, but it's really all about the heat and sedan. That's why a lot of homes have door ceiling windows, there's sliders. It's all about air and love back in the day. You guys can go yes, sir. The French lady? Yeah. French? She's French, but it is a, it's a, I know. She is French, but it is a um, Polish uh, artist. He came down here in 1981, 
he came down here as a journalist thinking he's going to write about this Christmas party that Jim Lennon has. It's quite famous. And he's thinking, if I can get myself an invite to this Christmas party, I can go back and write this fantastic article for my folks back in New York City. Now, when he comes down here in 1981, something else had happened in this room that involved Jim Williams. And it's not a good thing, actually. It's actually a really bad thing. A young man who worked for Jim Williams is violently out of control uh, one night. He's real strung out, and he's after Jim Williams. And in protecting himself and defending himself, Jim Williams will end up shooting and killing this young man in this room. And so it's quite, as you can imagine, pretty scandalous. And so John Brent immediately is going to switch gears about what's going on here with him being here. And he is not going to be here for two weeks writing a little article anymore. He's going to be here with Jim Williams for a long time. It's going to be about eight and a half years, because Jim Williams is going to have to suffer through four long jury trials until he finally gets his good name back. And so John Brent now is eight and a half years into it. He's no longer a journalist. He is now an author. And he has the help of Jim Williams to help him pen this book. It's primarily about Jim Williams, but it's also about Savannah. There's some other kooky people here in Savannah, some kooky things that go on. And when this book gets published in the early 1990s, it's a hit. The New York Times bestseller for nonfiction almost instantly. It changes everything for the city of Savannah. Our tourism business explodes from that book. Um, so that has a huge piece of history in here, and it does involve, of course, Jim Williams, <coughs> which is most unfortunate. He is uh, the center of the book, but it uh, will ignite our tourism business, that's for sure. And then a movie will be made, of course. Clint Eastwood is going to come here to Savannah. He is going to make a movie of the book, and um, he will film right here in the house. Not easy for uh, Clint Eastwood to make this movie. Everything in this house was so super valuable that he could not get any insurance in order to start his filming in the house. So he decided, what the heck, I'll take those into my own hands. He moves all the valuables out, which is pretty much everything that he can insure, and he makes reproductions of it. He moves that in so he can do his filming, and that's in fact what he did. Okay, what about in the room, y'all? Lots of things in here to talk about. If I remember correctly from the book, one big part of the Jim Williams case was that there was ricochet marking on the desk. Is this that? That is not this desk. Anything that was involved from that night is no longer here. As you can imagine, it got entered in as evidence, and of course, with family, of course, has no interest in having any of that yeah, returned. Understand. But everything, but this was an original desk of Jim Williams. It may have been in and out of here at times, um, actually. He did move things around. It could have been upstairs for a bit, but this is one of his business desks, if you will. And Jim Williams also died in this room. Yeah, he didn't. <laughs> That's the one thing. I'll be real honest, the book is pretty accurate uh, because Jim Williams had a heavy hand in helping to write it. Uh, the movie, of course, was made after Jim Williams passed away. Clint Eastwood, the director, took a little liberty there at the end. Jim Williams did not die in this room. He actually died in the hallway out there. Yeah. And this is a Uh-huh. Yeah, so back in his day, we were still able to collect things like this and have things. Of course, we're not doing that anymore, but it's a little snapshot from, from that time period. And why the <laughs> two? Ask Jim Williams. Anyway, no, he's a funny guy. Jim Williams likes to do a collect things like this. Okay, so first off, this is General George Scott up here. He's English, and these are not his legs. <laughs> and they actually belong to a French general, General Mathieu, so that's even a little bit funny. But they are, it is kind of a funny story. This is just, this is Jim Williams up here all the way around. He's got a funny sense of humor. He likes to do things like this, but the legs also have a story. They come from paintings like this. This happens to be a whistler up here. Uh, folks will have big old tall paintings like this, and they don't fit in rooms or they're uninterested in the bottom half of their painting, so they will chop them off and reframe them. There's paintings of legs floating around your mind as well. We do have some lights in the basement, y'all. <laughs> the, the clock is magnificent. This is a wonderful piece. It's from the Palace of Versailles. Uh, it was made by Lauren Day, the clockmaker there. Anyway, it would find its way somehow here to Savannah. Jim Williams is the guy that would finally rescue it. He will be the guy that sends it back overseas for restoration. It will take two long years to restore that clock. It does work perfectly. 
but in order for it to work, you gotta wind it. Family hardly ever winds it anymore, but it's, it's just exquisite. What would you say is the kind of total amount of the valuables in this house? You know, I have, throw a number on. I have no idea. <laughs> Now, I think the last time a real appraisal was done was after Jim Williams died, probably in the early, you know, maybe closer to 2000. But things have changed a lot. Some of the antiques and furnishings have come way down. Some of them haven't. Paintings have probably exploded on the way up. So I don't know why that much. I can tell you, I'm not putting a bit on pretty much anything in there. <laughs> <laughs> I beg your pardon? Security, yes, yeah, security. Oh, yes, of course, of course. <laughs> All right, anything else you have before we get to the other side of the home? Yeah, the two paintings here, and that one. Yes, I don't know. It's like a drawing thing. You know? I know, and, and, and I believe it is. I don't know a lot about it. Um, they're beautiful. I know you'll see a lot of uh, more of this when we get sort of to the man cave in the back. Uh, Jim Williams, of course, loves botanicals and anything to do with the great outdoors. So I don't know much about those two, quite frankly. Okay, we're gonna go straight across through those double doors. He was the author of the book? No, he didn't live with him. Oh, but he wrote the book. Part of the city. This is uh, theoretically the most prestigious square in the city. And then you've got our crown jewel about a block away. That's Forsyth Park. So we're uh, in a in, in, uh, in wonderful place here. Now this front room, this is a place that Jim Williams uh, liked to be. He's doing business right over there, but when he comes over here, there's no business. It means he's sitting down here with some of you and having a nice conversation, maybe having a cocktail, that kind of thing. So this is his relaxing room. And when he's not sitting here with a group of people, it means he's probably got a whole lot of people in here for one of his big old parties. And they're all over the house. So it's a wonderful house to entertain in. Now, one of the things I don't think I've talked about so far is Jim Williams' um, side of his life, which is really the restoration side of his life. And it's really about Savannah. When Jim Williams would come here to Savannah, he's 21 years old, right out of college. And this is the first time he's been to Savannah. It's 1952 when he's 21. And when he arrives here, this place is not pretty. It doesn't look like what y'all are visiting today. It's kind of crumbling and falling apart, simply for the fact that most of these homes that are big and beautiful like this, they were too expensive to keep up and or modernize. And so people couldn't sell them because people wouldn't buy them because they didn't have the money to restore them and modernize them. So you've got this whole nasty situation going on. So Jim Williams decided as a young man when he arrives here, he's gonna have something to do with this the situation, and he will reverse a lot of what was going on. He would team up with those ladies from the Historic Preservation Foundation. They would run around buying up these properties that were about ready for the wrecking ball city that's gonna come take all this away. They would buy up these properties that didn't probably cost anything, and then they would partner with Jim Williams. Jim Williams would take the money out of his wealthy pocketbook, which he had a lot of money, and he's gonna restore over 70 homes here in Savannah. Yeah, so he saved our city, really, with those ladies. It was all, he lost money every time. He was not doing it to make money. He was doing it to restore and bring back the beauty in Savannah and hoping that people would come back and live in these homes. You didn't have to necessarily just go to the suburbs now to find beautiful new modern homes. You could have them right here downtown. So a lot of work done by Jim Williams. So he had a lot of things going on all the time here. That Armstrong house is right down the street from us here. It's right on the corner. It used to be the college. That college almost took this thing down because they needed a parking lot in a gymnasium. <laughs> and if those ladies hadn't come in and scooped the, this house up and bought it, it would have been long gone. 
So when the college could not get their hands on this property for a parking lot in the gymnasium, they left their um, Armstrong College and went out of town. And so then Jim Williams would restore that Armstrong College and bring it back as a home. So he restored that Armstrong house. It's a beautiful home. You can't miss it. It's just right down the street. It's a private home today, Armstrong Kessler House. But he put all that back together. And this is where that mantle came from. He took it from the Armstrong house. It's beautiful car, career, marble. Okay, so yeah, Jim Williams had his hand on a lot of our most important buildings here in Savannah. And we're real thankful that he and the ladies, and he served as their president on that board for many years with those ladies. So he had a nice working relationship with them. Now this guy, I think we talked about him on the way in, Alexander Tel Telfair Howersham. He's eight years old in this painting. Quite the name, you know, quite the prestige. And he did live in the most prestigious home. We talked about that, though. The um, old pink house is where he grew up. His dad loved that. Jim Williams is the guy to restore that old pink house. <coughs> He'll do that after he does this home. And luckily, otherwise, it would have been gone to Reckonball's Common. And so he saved it, did a beautiful job in restoring it. He has wherewithal to think about this old historic home, only two of them left, and the most prestigious one, to you know, redo it uh, as a restaurant. So there's lots and lots of people can visit there and have a wonderful meal. Go down below in the tavern and have that same meal, but it's a lot of fun down there. Okay, right below our friend up here, those candlesticks, those were originally owned by George and Martha Washington. Mm -hmm. A lot of history here. Come on down to the main page, y'all. Oh, question about this lady. Do you know her? Like she looks like this one. Or something. Well, they all. You know, if you notice, most of the ladies. There's not a whole lot of them hanging. We saw Miss Prelo. Don't know much about her. Back, most of these are 17, 1800s paintings. They were not supposed to smile, but also too, I think they were in quite a bit of pain because they had to wear those corsets. And they were horrible. They were very, very uncomfortable. They would like break your ribs. So I think that's part of that. And I don't know a lot about who she is. She's, she's unhappy. Yeah, very. That's what I know. <laughs> she's probably super wealthy and unhappy. Jim Williams. This is a classic picture of him. 
He's about 40 years old. This is kind of what he looked like when he first moved into this home. And that is the love of his life. Oh my gosh, because he loves Sheldon. He will find her and rescue her. She's abandoned at the Sheldon Church. So she gets to come live here. She, she got to do what she wanted to do in this home. This is her favorite room. We need a lot of leftover Sheldon on the yellow sofa and uh -huh. the screen chair. Mm -hmm. They don't have any like light here, or did they? And I think the primary reason is because it's the music room and all about the acoustics. So those niches in the wall, the green indents, that's where they for used to have the making sure like a small piano like that plays well. And I think possibly it could be about the acoustics not having mm -hmm. the chandelier, but I'm not, I'm not certain. Probably. Yeah. That's all my walking on. All right, y'all. Let me take y'all down. Please watch your step. You know these steps are slick. Six fifty. They should serve us lunch and drinks. Agreed. <laughs> or even give us a bottle of water. These are. Oh, good. I'm glad you liked it. Yes, ma'am. 
Y'all enjoy your time here. We live here. <laughs> well, I just so outside. I see I'm yes, from Canada, so okay. this is the first here, of yeah. this okay. kind of thing. I just so showed it's her exciting. the movie and everything. I'm okay, trying to get her on the book now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good second, evening. Um, there's two on my tour right before y'all that are from Savannah. I don't get that too often. Yeah. 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 So it's kind of fun. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah. We'll Thank come you back. much. Thank yes, ma'am. We will. All right, ma'am. Sorry. Thank you, buddy. Let's see. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm gonna talk. Oh, yeah. I gotta turn around. Hey, what's up, guys? Hi, guys. So we just finished, obviously, the Mercer House. We're sorry if uh, the view wasn't that good, but we're not. It's not allowed. Um, but we wanted to sneak you guys in. As long in. as we kept it on the belt, they were okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we hope you all are doing fine. We are planning on doing uh, an investigation. Soon. soon but it keeps raining yeah, and the, uh, really the weather hasn't been cooperating but we have about four other places we're just waiting for people to call us back so we could do investigations okay so we're gonna talk to you really really quick yeah. so um yeah the kingsland um the kingsland witch grave we're gonna go to that um we're just trying to make sure that the uh, cooperation in the weather um my brother's a police officer down there <clears throat> so he wants to um actually go he actually wants to do an interview so y'all can answer, ask him some questions. Um, and then he wants to go on an investigation with us. So um, we got a couple of places down there we want to check out. Um, we may or not be able to, may or may not be able to go live there because last time I tried to go live there, um, it gave us a problem uh, with the internet connection because it's so far in the middle of nowhere. We got to smoke because fucking mosquitoes are horrible. Um, but <laughs> Terry is going to record with her phone too just in case so if there's any interruptions with the with my camera then her camera will be recording so we won't lose anything um yeah and we're just waiting on some phone calls so we hope you all enjoyed this this is the mercer house um that was a very interesting tour it was a good hour yeah so um yeah i hope you guys enjoyed it uh let's see i'd like to keep watching but i don't want to yeah so um you guys be safe if you have any questions leave a comment so how haunted is the mercer house that's what you just said uh, we don't know she did see an orb go by her head when we oh, were sitting there. and you know what when actually when we were in um his the room his office where where he shot the boy that was that was yes, a little eerie feeling i felt i had goosebumps like run right up and if you notice at one point in time i don't know if anybody else noticed it but i noticed it the lights kind of flickered a little bit i didn't they notice dimmed that. enough yeah so go back and check that out when we were about in that room but the light did dim everywhere else to me it, it just felt um comfortable yeah and homey is the only word i could describe um so i don't know but it was just something fun we wanted to do for you guys um give y'all something because the weather has not been cooperating they don't allow ghost hunts here um so we've got a few other places that are in this vicinity that are haunted that taps has went to i believe is the cereal weed house we're yes. looking into that we're waiting on a phone call back so we love you guys y'all keep it spooky take yeah. care everyone all right see you guys <laughs> how do you end the damn thing there it goes